Hey guys, today I'll show you a horror thriller TV series named High School of the Dead. Spoilers ahead, watch out and take care. The drama begins in a Japanese high school, where a high schooler named Takashi is brooding on the rooftop of the school building. He unexpectedly sees a middle-aged man causing trouble at the school gate, who also seems to be mentally unstable. Faced with the threats of the school's security guard, he doesn't back down, but rather bites into him, resulting in a mouthful of fresh and juicy sashimi. The intense pain fills his body, causing him to faint after a horrific scream like a duck. When a teacher comes to check, the guard's eyes suddenly snap open. He immediately grabs her sexy body and bites her skinny muscles in the neck. Takashi, who witnessed this scene, completely panics. He rushes back to the classroom to find his childhood sweetheart, Rei, wanting to take her and run away. This action upsets Saya, who had a secret crush on Takashi. Rei, however, finds the whole situation absurd and refuses to go with him. Unexpectedly, Takashi slaps her in the face. Left with no choice, Rei reluctantly agrees to leave with Takashi and her friend. At this moment, an announcement is broadcasted throughout the school, saying that the school is experiencing an unknown act of campus violence. All teachers are asked to organize the students and evacuate in an orderly manner. However, before they can finish speaking, a heart-wrenching scream comes from the broadcast as if something horrific has happened. After a moment of silence, the entire campus erupts into chaos. Screams of terror, confusion, fear, and the unknown cause everyone to scramble and run in all directions. Pushing, shoving, trampling, and rudeness. In this moment, all the ugliness and distortion of human nature are perfectly displayed. However, Takashi and the others were prepared. They didn't choose to escape through the crowded school building, but instead chose the relatively deserted administration building. But as soon as they arrived, they found the infatuated literature teacher acting like a lunatic. Ray, who was encountering this kind of situation for the first time, was so scared that she even revealed her smelly underwear. After a moment to compose herself, Ray swings the mop stick in her hand at the literature teacher. After a flurry of moves, Ray successfully stabs the mop stick into the teacher's hairy chest. Surprisingly, this attack does not affect the teacher at all, and after a brief pause, he regains his ability to move. As they wonder what had happened to the teacher, their friend rushes up and holds the teacher in a chokehold from behind. Even when warned by Takashi, he confidently states that he can handle it. But then something unexpected happens. The teacher's head suddenly turns at an incredible angle and bites their friend's shoulder. No matter how much Takashi and Rei attack, he does not let go. Seeing what's happening, Takashi doesn't have time to think. He raises his baseball bat and smashes it down on the teacher. Finally, the terrifying teacher falls to the ground, dead as shit. Subsequently, the trio decided to head towards the rooftop together. The rooftop, devoid of people, seemed the best place to wait for aerial rescue. A panoramic view of the city from the rooftop showed smoke everywhere. The school grounds, the corridors, everywhere was filled with bloodshed and the ugliness of human nature on full display. Takashi started to realize that these were all dead people, the kind of dead people who eat humans, no different from the zombies in Daniel C.C. movies. Once bitten, one would become one of them. The only way to eliminate them was to destroy their heads. While the three of them were talking, more and more zombies started to surround the rooftop. They had no choice but to head to a higher place and block the stairs. Takashi led the way, and the three pushed forward together, knocking down one zombie after another. In the midst of the chaos, Ray tripped and fell heavily to the ground. Without any hesitation, a maniac rushed towards her by tracing her smell. Just in the nick of time, their friend stepped forward. He snatched the baseball bat from Takashi's hand and managed to hit the zombie, saving Ray. After a close call, the three of them successfully escaped to the rooftop and blocked the stairs with tables, chairs, and other objects. However, their friend, who had been bitten earlier, was getting worse by the minute. His face was covered in blood, and he was spitting out blood from time to time. He knew he didn't have much time left. He wanted to jump off the building to end his shitty life, but he didn't have the courage. He could only ask Takashi to help him end his suffering as he didn't want to turn into a dreadful, ugly creature. He wanted to remain handsome even at the end of his life. But as soon as he finished speaking, he passed out in pain. Just when Takashi was about to do the deed, Rei threw her heavy body on their friend to stop him. She refused to believe that their friend would turn into a zombie. Just then, their friend moved. He sat up straight, stood up, and started walking towards Rei, who was in disbelief. Takashi then coldly said it was indeed ridiculous, but it was also an undeniable fact. With a loud shout, he charged towards their friend's body. 
After killing him, Takashi and Rei sat by the wall. They had gone through too much in just one or two hours since the sudden disaster struck. Suddenly, Rei remembered her father, who was a police officer. She decided to call him to find out what was going on. The phone was answered immediately. Amidst the static, she could hear her father's voice, but it was choppy and unclear. What was more terrifying was the sound of a gunshot from the other end of the phone. Just when her father was about to tell them where to go, the call ended abruptly, leaving behind a busy tone. Meanwhile, Saya and her fat classmate Kota were fleeing together through the school building. Kota suggested seeking help from the school teachers, but under such circumstances, it was unlikely anyone would be that kind-hearted. After his suggestion was rejected, Kota proposed calling the police. However, Saya explained that Japan's population was 120 million, with the proportion of police and security forces being minuscule. If the same situation occurred within their ranks, it wouldn't help much. In the infirmary, the naturally clueless school nurse, Shizuka, also discovered the characteristics of the zombies. Just as she prepared to gather some emergency medicine, a horde of zombies broke into the infirmary. One of the students was caught and bitten to death by the zombies in an attempt to protect her. Just as the zombies swarmed and reached out to harass her, a long-haired girl wielding a wooden sword appeared. Her gaze was decisive and ruthless, and her actions were without mercy. After dealing with the horde, she crouched down and comforted the student injured from protecting Shizuka. Then, without any hesitation, she offered him mercy, sending him straight to meet Jesus. This girl was the school's third-year kendo club president, Seiko. For unknown reasons, seeing yet another wave of zombies attacking, a strange curve appeared at the corner of Seiko's mouth. On the other hand, Saya and Kota found the school's tool room. The room was fully equipped with air guns, saws, wrenches, which could be used to make some simple self-defense weapons. But seeing Kota still looking weak, Saya felt an indescribable irritation. Even if her chosen teammate was as useless as a chubby pig, she had to carry him along. She impatiently instructed Kota to make some weapons for self-defense. Seeing the violent zombies outside the door, Saya was extremely anxious, not noticing the confident look in Kota's eyes. He was busy with cutting, binding, and assembling the weapons. Soon after, the classroom door was broken open, and several zombies rushed towards Saya like mad cows. Instantly, nails pierced into the zombies' foreheads. The same Kota, who was fiercely looking at the zombies a second ago, turned his head with a smile and asked Saya to load bullets for him. He had successfully made a simple nail gun. Atop the rooftop, Takashi and Ray weren't idle either. They took down the fire hose, turned on the valve, and a high-pressure stream of water burst out. It instantly knocked down the approaching zombies that were about to reach the rooftop. They easily dealt with these once deadly creatures. Then, one armed with a stick and the other with a gun, they cooperatively eliminated the remaining two zombies. They didn't want to just seek and wait for rescue because that was meaningless. They could only rely on themselves to break out and find other survivors who managed to stay alive. Together, they would devise ways to return home. Although Takashi always appeared relaxed in front of Rei, he felt quite uneasy in his heart. His mother was an elementary school teacher and her place, another school, was also filled with dangers. Meanwhile, Saya discovered through a towel test that the zombies didn't possess any perceptual abilities of their own. They only had an extremely sensitive reaction to sound. However, it would take time to understand what precisely they relied on to move. During their conversation, a group of zombies silently approached them from behind. On another side, following Shizuka's request, Seiko needed to take her to the staff room. This was because all the car keys were stored there. If they succeeded in getting the car keys, it would greatly increase their chances of escaping and surviving. Suddenly, Shizuka tripped and fell due to her heavy body. Seiko looked at her and thought her tight outfit was not suitable for running away, so she squatted down and tore up her skirt. Suddenly, a loud noise came from where Kota and Saya were. They were in danger. Just then, a zombie appeared behind Saya, immediately scaring her into screaming like a chicken. To make matters worse, Kota's nail gun ran out of ammunition just as Saya was in immediate danger. In desperation, Saya fearfully grabbed something and stabbed it towards the zombie. It was a power drill. Accompanied by the roar of the drill and Saya's chicken scream, blood splattered everywhere. Only when the zombie's arm dropped did Saeko Takashi and others arrive in time. As expected, the group of zombies was easily taken care of, but Saya was clearly terrified. She sat on the ground, her face full of horror, and she couldn't snap out of it for a long time. 
Seeing this, Rei and Shizuka immediately comforted and encouraged her. Seiko, the kendo club president of the third year, Takashi, Koda from the second year, and Rei from the gun club all looked calm and composed. When Saya came back to her senses, she was suddenly furious. Such an unthinkable thing had happened, but everyone was so composed. She didn't understand, and she angrily roared. Facing Saiko's comfort and seeing herself covered in blood in the mirror, she finally couldn't hold back and burst into tears. Afterwards, a group of people found a staff room to take a brief rest. They had agreed to escape using Shizuka's mini car, but now it couldn't fit everyone, leaving them in a fix. It was then that Seiko suggested using the school's minibus, the keys to which were conveniently located in the staff room. Takashi also proposed that they visit each of their homes in order, looking for their family members before collectively seeking a safe haven. Suddenly, Saeko turned on the television as if struck by a thought. The news showed two body bags intended for disposal suddenly springing to life. This caused an uproar, but a second later, two gunshots brought silence again. The news anchor hastily paused the broadcast at this point. Scenes of the dead reviving, violently attacking, and bloodthirsty creatures were plastered across the screen in a world under a zombie onslaught, raising the question of how to maintain order amid the chaos. The live news showed two bodies in body bags suddenly sitting up, causing screams of panic. Two gunshots put them back down. The scene cut back to the studio, with the anchor advising the public to stay indoors, not to move around, and to wait quietly for the situation to resolve. Takashi, with a punch on the table, expressed his anger at the news being so nonchalant about the situation. But Saya analyzed that this was probably a strategy by the government to prevent widespread panic, which could lead to a breakdown in order. If the public couldn't face these terrifying revived bodies, it would only make things worse. The television continued to report the fact. Due to the murder disease, the U.S. had abandoned the White House in Washington, and even the Chinese capital had turned into a sea of fire. Saya explained that there have been similar mass diseases in history, such as the unknown flu that broke out in Spain in 1918, which infected about 600 million people and caused 50 million deaths. The Black Death that ravaged Europe in the 14th century caused one-third of Europe's population to die. Upon hearing this, Takashi hurriedly asked how these incidents ended. To his dread, Shizuka answered that when enough people died, there would naturally be no more targets for infection. However, she seemed to think of something and happily stated that summer would soon arrive. Therefore, in about 20 days, the bodies could be partially skeletonized. But Seiya thought that zombies were not within the scope of medical objects, so whether they would rot was still an open question. In any case, she emphasized the need to survive first. The group quickly organized all their current equipment and supplies. Takashi led the group out of the staff room first. Not far out, they found another pair of trapped students. Without wasting words, Takashi immediately led his team to the rescue. With the help of the others, they easily dealt with the zombies surrounding the students. Takashi then invited the students to join their team to increase their chances of survival. The group hid in a staircase corner, observing the zombies' habits. Although they had theorized that zombies only react to sound, this was just a conjecture without substantial evidence. Without a choice, the group decided to send a member to test this theory, and Takashi volunteered to take on this task. As Takashi set out, Rei wanted to stop him but was held back by Seiko, who told her to be a good girl and not to stop a determined man. Accompanied by silence, Takashi went down the stairs. The heavy atmosphere felt like it could ring out water droplets. He stood quietly in the middle of the herd of corpses, proving his theory right. He quickly picked up a shoe from the ground and threw it into the distance, drawing the zombies away with the noise. Seizing this opportunity, Seiko and Takashi quickly opened the main door, and the group quietly escaped from the academic building. However, as the last student was passing through, his weapon accidentally collided with the stair railing, causing a loud noise that alerted all the zombies. Takashi ordered everyone to run, but the surge of zombies was also increasing. With Seiko, Takashi, and Rei leading the way, they slowly carved out a bloody path. But because of the size of the team, a male student fell behind and was surrounded by zombies. His girlfriend, unable to abandon him, rushed forward to save him but ended up getting bitten as well. Under the cover of Seiko and Takashi, Shizuka quickly got the school bus keys, opened the door, and everyone filed into the bus. The number of zombies outside the bus was growing. Just as everyone was about to board and set off, a group ran towards them from afar, composed of both teachers and students. The number of zombies in front of the school bus was increasing, and if they didn't depart soon, they would be trapped here. 
Takashi couldn't bear to see innocent people lose their lives, so he wanted to get off the bus to assist. However, Ray stopped him, arguing that these people weren't worth saving. While they were talking, a student from the rushing group tripped. He asked a shady teacher named Shady for help, but to everyone's surprise, Shady kicked him down, leaving him behind to delay the zombies and buy himself some time. Once everyone was on board, Shizuka slammed on the gas pedal. The bus abruptly shot out of the parking lot, accelerating continuously. It rammed and crushed zombies across the campus, ultimately breaking through the school gate and escaping. Just as everyone began to breathe a sigh of relief, Shady approached and asked if their leader was Seiko from the Kendo Club. After learning they didn't have a leader, he insisted that it was impossible to survive in this apocalypse without one. At this point, Ray looked at Takashi and seriously warned him that he would regret saving Shady. Suddenly, the school bus drove onto an overpass. Everyone saw the entire city was filled with rolling smoke, ruins, chaos, and the stench of blood. A disagreement broke out in the bus. A punk suggested that continuing forward would only increase their risk and that they should find a safe place to hold out. This idea was approved by some. The main question was why should everyone follow Takashi, which annoyed many. But the next moment, Ray rose to her feet and knocked the punk down with a stick. At this point, Shady stood up. He praised Ray and Takashi's excellent teamwork and said the disagreement only further proved the necessity of his previous proposal. He hinted that he was the only teacher on the bus and therefore had a solid reason to take on the role of leader in order to protect everyone to the greatest extent. After his speech, the students began to applaud and agree with him. He declared that in the case of majority rule, he was now the leader. For some reason, Ray seemed increasingly uncomfortable. Shady tried to leave the bus alone. Just as Takashi was about to follow and persuade him, an out-of-control bus full of zombies crashed into them. The resulting explosion separated the two from the main group. To everyone's surprise, a group of flaming zombies walked out of the overturned bus. Takashi had no choice but to agree to meet with Seiko at the police station in the Eastern District the next day. Now alone, Takashi and Rei found a motorcycle. On the other side, Seiko and his group were stuck in a traffic jam, trying to leave the city. With the intermittent sounds of gunshots and zombies outside, some of the female students began to scream in fear. At this moment, Shady stood up to embrace them, providing them with much-needed comfort and encouragement. However, they failed to notice the shady gleam in Shady's eyes, a sight not missed by Seiko and Saya. Meanwhile, Takashi and Ray were weaving through the city on a motorcycle. The once bustling streets had turned into a desolate wasteland with visible destruction everywhere and animals feeding on corpses. Along the way, they stumbled upon an abandoned police car with a deceased officer inside. After a thorough search by Ray, they found a few items, a handgun, a pen, and a pair of handcuffs. With their equipment upgraded, they hit the road again. Soon after, they arrived at a gas station to refuel the motorcycle. However, it was a coin-operated station, and they didn't have any money. Left with no choice, Takashi decided to try his luck in the nearby convenience store, a baseball bat held high. He had always wanted to do this. Suddenly, a maniac appeared behind Ray. By the time Takashi heard her chicken scream and rushed out, Ray was being held hostage at knife point. The maniac held her tightly, complimenting her cuteness with obvious ill intent. Despite Takashi's threats, the maniac claimed that in this monster-filled world, survival required a woman, and he even tried to touch Ray's arm. Takashi was fuming at this sight. The maniac seemed slightly unhinged, murmuring about how his family had all turned into zombies. He had blown off all their heads, his fathers, his mothers, his grandmothers, even his little sisters who was in elementary school. Then he started laughing in a disturbing manner. Seizing a moment of distraction, Ray tried to escape, but the maniac was quick to capture her sexy body back, holding her like a chicken toy. Left with no choice, Takashi complied with the maniac's demands and filled up the motorcycle's tank. Just as Takashi was about to hand over the keys, he suddenly lunged at the maniac, pressing the gun against his chest. The maniac froze in fear. Takashi didn't hesitate. He pulled the trigger. The force of the shot knocked the maniac to the ground, intense pain spreading throughout his body. Ray wanted to punish the maniac further, but Takashi stopped her, insisting they needed to leave immediately. It was then that Ray realized their actions had attracted a horde of zombies. However, in this apocalyptic world, survival of the fittest, where the weak could only await death. When the world crumbled under the onslaught of zombies, politicians, and the wealthy were the first to receive the quickest and safest rescue. But the ordinary folks had to fight for their own or wait for their tragic fates. 
In the crosshairs of a sniper scope appeared a sexy zombie. A slender Barrett rifle fired, causing an explosive report. The following second, blood was splattered everywhere and a zombie fell dead. Then came the second, the third, and so on, until all zombies that obstructed the airport runway were eliminated. All this was the work of a stunning woman named Kaori, one of the top five sharpshooters in the country. She was ordered to clear the airport of zombies to ensure the safe evacuation of key government officials. After all zombies were killed, a fully armed firefighting team appeared, dealing with the zombie corpses. As the plane took off, Kaori's teammates worried in silence, for bullets, after all, were finite. On the other side, Seiko and his group were stuck in traffic trying to leave the city. Teacher Shady was attempting to brainwash the students, suggesting that they should disperse only after reaching a safe place. Even though they were concerned about their families, they had to be fully prepared as a team. But his speech only excited the more naive students. Others, like Seiko Saya, were lost in their thoughts, or simply sleeping. Saya woke up Koda, who was sleeping, and pointed at the departing plane, analyzing that the danger level in the city was very high. Those escaping by plane were important officials, possibly heading to isolated islands or heavily armed areas, like military bases in Hokkaido or Kyushu. Kota suggested they should also head to those places, but Saya disagreed, explaining that such places like the self-defense forces and U.S. military bases would use their armed forces to suppress zombies and implement strict containment measures. After all, this was the future direction of world development. Any containment would bear the risk of total annihilation. Their team was just not strong enough and lacked reliable people to rely on. Kota teased Saya about her crush on Takashi. Meanwhile, the team of Takashi and Rei was not doing well either. With the gradual collapse of order, the dangers in this world were not just zombies, but also the ubiquitous ugliness of human nature. While passing a supermarket, they encountered some men who looked like gang members brutally assaulting civilians. When they saw Takashi and Rei trying to escape, they ordered their men to attack. Those with madness in their eyes, attacking them, were seemingly honest and decent people in normal times. Office workers, shop owners. Fortunately, Takashi revved the motorcycle and dodged the attack, swiftly escaping. Rei looked back at these people in confusion, wondering why they were attacking when they were clearly not zombies. But Takashi explained that they were just losing control due to the panic. On the bridge under the protection of the military, a handful of rebellious teenagers tried to force their way past the guardrails, provoking the police, claiming they were protected by juvenile law. But the military paid them no mind instead, unleashing a water cannon that sent them tumbling into the river below. Meanwhile, on the school bus, Shady was passing passionately delivering a speech, driving the students into a frenzy. Seiya, watching this unfold, exclaimed that they were witnessing the birth of Shady's Shady Doctrine. Seiko watched the pedestrians outside and suggested that being stuck in traffic wasn't productive. They should get off the bus and walk. This way, they could keep their promise to Takashi. After a discussion, they realized that their family members were either abroad or very far away. So, even if they were worried, it wouldn't help. They just needed to take care of themselves. Saya stood up and bluntly informed the others that they should leave. But unexpectedly, Shady was ready to abandon them without hesitation. It would be a problem if they left Shizuka, the school nurse. As he approached with a menacing look, intending to force Shizuka to stay, a long nail whizzed past his cheek, embedding itself in the back of a seat. Shady was stunned. Koda, who usually seemed harmless, had shot without hesitation. Calmly, Koda explained that he had already taken out many zombies at the school. If anyone still wanted to stop them, he would not hesitate to help them meet their end. With Koda's protection, everyone managed to get off the bus. But watching them run, Shady's eyes were filled with resentment and frustration. Sadly, their good luck didn't last long. Seiko and the others encountered a horde of zombies. Saya and Shizuka were lacking in combat skills. After a fierce battle, Kota ran out of bullets, but Seiko was not afraid. They had to fight to survive. In the chaos, Shizuka accidentally fell on Saya. Suddenly, the sound of a motorcycle engine echoed. Takashi and Rei were like heavenly soldiers, clearing most of the zombies with a skillful drift. Rei leapt high, piercing a zombie's face, then with a spinning shot, took down two more zombies. Takashi, on the other hand, threw his handgun to Kota. As soon as he caught the gun, Kota immediately took out two zombies with a double shot. Takashi drifted again, knocking two zombies off the bridge. He then accelerated towards Seiko. In that instant, they joined forces and launched their ultimate attack, relieving the crisis. Rei joyously threw 
threw her skinny body at Shizuka, everyone finally reunited. But as night fell, they realized it wasn't safe to continue traveling in this zombie-infested world. Shizuka suddenly mentioned that she had a friend nearby who owned a house. She usually kept the keys to help clean the place. They could rest there for the night. Hearing this, Saya and Koda gathered around with mischievous smiles. Moreover, the house had vehicles they could use. After days of tension, they finally found a place to relax. Warm water, fragrant shampoo, everything was incredibly relaxing. While the girls enjoyed this rare comfort, the two guys had to find and stash weapons. After working together, they managed to pry open a safe. But when they opened it, they were stunned by what they found, a mini arsenal. Kota, a military enthusiast, was particularly excited to find these semi-automatic rifles, a crossbow capable of taking down a grizzly bear and an anti-explosion shotgun. Unlike the carefree laughter from the girls, Takashi asked Kota a question that had been bothering him. Why was he so familiar with firearms? Kota confidently revealed that he had once hired a private military company to train him while visiting the U.S. His instructor was even a former special forces captain. No wonder Kota's shooting skills were so exceptional. But Kota was also puzzled. All these weapons were prohibited in Japan. He wondered who Shizuka's friend was. Takashi explained that he seemed to be a member of the Japanese Special Police Force. Unlike the fleeting tranquility of this cabin, the bridge leading out of the city has long been blocked by disaster-stricken people. The media stationed here have even dubbed this catastrophe as the murderous disease. Unbeknownst to the protesting crowd being let through, the soldiers blocking their way have also been abandoned by the government, left with a simple directive to sort it out themselves. What's even more unsettling is the emergence of a group within the protesting crowd. They accuse the U.S. and Japan of causing this worldwide disaster disaster due to a leak from their joint biological lab. Suddenly, a commotion arises from behind the police line. One of the officers has turned into a zombie, and a horde is approaching. After the officers regain their composure and eliminate the threat, they notice a mother in the crowd, cradling her child and crying for help. However, something seems off about her child. Suddenly, the child, previously appearing weak and ill in his mother's arms, savagely bites her neck. The officers, left with no choice, open fire once again, eliminating them both. This action incites the already protesting crowd, who vocally oppose the indiscriminate shooting. The police chief steps forward, advising the protest leader to disperse quickly or everyone will be in danger. But the leader refuses to listen, believing the chief is lying and covering up the government's and America's heinous crimes. In desperation, the chief threatens that they have orders to maintain order and can take any necessary measures. Meanwhile, the girls who have finished bathing come out of the bathroom, but they all seem a little off. After strenuously settling Shizuka and Saya, Takashi turns around only to see the school senior, Seiko, wearing an apron and cooking. With a calm expression, she tells him that she has no clothes to wear because they're all being washed. She also tells him that he doesn't have to keep calling her Senior Seiko, he can just call her name. Everything is back to normal. Kota is on the balcony with a telescope on the lookout, while Saeko is in charge of making dinner. However, Rei, who has found Takashi alone, seems a little off. Before Takashi can react, Rei blushes and moves closer to him for a tongue massage. This world has gone mad under the zombie attack. The government has resorted to deploying bulldozers to crush the masses, and even the police officers tasked with maintaining order can't bear the pressure. Some have even turned their guns on themselves. In stark contrast to the lurking dangers outside, Takashi's cabin maintains a semblance of comfort, but the peace is short-lived. Suddenly, the sound of barking echoes from outside, and upon investigating from the balcony, they realize that the number of zombies around is growing. The situation deteriorates beyond control, leaving Takashi frustrated. He is eager to grab a gun and eliminate the zombies, but Sayeko stops him. She warns him that the zombies are sensitive to sound, and rash gunfire would only attract more of them. After her words, Seiko turns off the cabin lights. She cautions Takashi that mere bravado won't ensure survival in this world. They must be wary of other living humans. They don't have the power to save everyone and must adapt to this fallen world. While Takashi is scanning the vicinity with night vision goggles, he spots a man with a little girl seeking refuge in a local residence. The innocent girl asks about her mother, and the man kneels to comfort her, never letting his weapon out of his grip. He pleads with the homeowner for temporary shelter for him and his daughter, even if it's just for the girl. However, all they receive 
receive our curses and dismissal. Despite the man's plea, the homeowner shuts off the lights. The man threatens to break in if the door isn't opened, and finally, the door creaks open. The man's relief is fleeting as his smile instantly freezes. He can't believe it as he looks down at his wound, his clothes already soaking in blood. When he looks up, the people in the house are still pleading for divine forgiveness and salvation. In front of the girl, the knife is pulled out from her father's body, and his blood slowly flows out. He staggers backward, watching the hopeful door close once again. The girl collapses beside her father, calling out to him in despair, but he has no strength left to get up. Coughing up blood, he reassures her that he's fine and tells her to play a game of hide-and-seek, to hide and not get found by anyone. With that, he collapses. Unable to contain her grief, the girl bursts into tears, attracting the attention of the zombies. The sight forces Takashi to shut his eyes, but the next second, the sound of a gunshot pierces the night. One shot follows another, until all zombies around the girl collapse. While death and fighting rage outside, Saya and others in the cabin are sleeping, snoring like pigs. Unable to suppress his urge to help, Takashi prepares to leave the cabin to rescue the girl. Seiko assures him that she will protect the home and encourages him to save the girl. Ray hands him a pistol, cautioning him to be careful and not act recklessly. As Seiko opens the front door, Takashi revs the motorcycle, its roar filling the air. With Koda's accurate cover fire, Takashi weaves through the zombie horde on his motorcycle. Just when he reaches the girl's location, he runs over a human leg, causing him to lose control and crash. Before he can react, the zombies swarm him, but just in time, Kota's support arrives. The little girl is crouched in a corner, crying. A zombie is about to grab her when Takashi arrives. He fights off the zombie and turns to give the girl a confident smile. At this moment, the people at home are not idle either. With all the commotion, the nearby zombies are sure to be attracted. So Saya takes command of the group, gathering all the supplies, medicine, food, firearms, everything is loaded into the car. But now, a new problem arises. The Gathered supplies are piled high and the car is parked outside the house. This undoubtedly increases the danger for everyone, but they have to get it done. While the zombies are all distracted by Takashi, Seiko takes the lead in ensuring safety and vigilance. The rest of the group is responsible for quickly transporting the supplies. Kota, who is responsible for supporting Takashi, is somewhat worried. Looking at the swarm of zombies outside, he thinks that even if their vehicle is a Tesla, it would be hard to rescue Takashi. But the next second, he laughs. It seems that Takashi has come up with a brilliant escape plan. Plan. He carries the girl on his back and carefully escapes along the walls of the house. But the narrow walls are crowded with zombies on both sides, so he has to be extremely careful. A tiny mistake could lead to an irreversible fate. However, the girl's dog seems somewhat uncooperative. Luckily, the grieving girl promptly controls the dog. But suddenly, a zombie below hooks Takashi's shoelaces. Caught off guard, he stumbles but manages to regain his balance. A roar is heard, and Seiko is seen standing on the roof of the speeding Tesla. With a beautiful drift, she successfully stops at the intersection waiting for rescue. The three of them leap down, easily dealing with two zombies. Koda even brings out his shotgun, knocking down a large group of zombies. Seeing this, Takashi is greatly relieved. Carrying the girl, he steps forward and lands on the roof of the vehicle. Everyone is on board. Shizuka steps on the accelerator, and the Tesla speeds away. After a night's rest in the car, everyone uses the vehicle's wading ability to cross the water over the bridge. Everyone learns that the little girl's name is Alice, and Koda is particularly fond of little Alice. He puts her in front of him, singing and playing. After crossing the river, the group gets off the car on the shore for a short rest and changes into the dry clothes brought by Shizuka. While the girls are changing clothes, Kota hands over the shotgun to Takashi, carefully explaining how to use it. He also specifically mentions the gun's capacity and recoil. Takashi assures that he will take it seriously, but will use it as a shield if necessary. While the two men are talking, the girls finish changing clothes. The next scene leaves the three males on the scene dumbfounded, especially Ray, who directly attaches a bayonet to her long gun. Everything is ready to go. Takashi and Kota lead the way, first climbing the river embankment to check the situation. After confirming it's safe, Shizuka steps on the accelerator and the Tesla charges up the embankment like a wild beast. After a brief discussion, everyone decides to head to Saya's house, which is the closest. Takashi steps forward, hesitating as if he wants to say something, but Saya is smart. She knows what he wants to say. She doesn't hold out much hope. On the way, everyone is surprised to discover that after crossing the river, they haven't encountered a single zombie. Even the helicopter that was hovering above them the previous day is gone. 
The surrounding environment seems no different from usual, the only anomaly being the eerily silent, deserted streets. As Takashi closes his eyes to enjoy this surreal peace, Kota hears the sound of zombies about 300 meters ahead. Saya quickly directs Shizuka to turn right. Unexpectedly, there are still zombies after the turn. They turn left again, but there are even more zombies. With no other choice, they floor the accelerator to break through. Suddenly, they realize that someone has set up a wire fence ahead. A direct collision would result in a fatal accident. Therefore, Shizuka releases the accelerator and sharply turns the car. Ray, who was on lookout duty on the roof, is thrown under the car. The surrounding zombies seize the opportunity to attack. Takashi jumps down and raises his shotgun in self-defense. However, he is using it for the first time and didn't anticipate the strong recoil. At such a close range, he not only fails to hit the zombies but is also forced to step back. Kota quickly crawls out of the car, instructing Takashi to establish a solid stance and aim near the chest. This way, the recoil could help him blow off the zombies' heads. Surely enough, after trying this, he successfully shoots two zombies. Just when Takashi was getting the hang of it, his shotgun ran out of bullets. In his panic, he reaches for more bullets but finds none. At this point, Seiko gets out of the car. She tells Takashi to check on Rei while she holds off the zombies. Takashi quickly assesses Rei's injuries and finds that, due to the severe impact, she is unable to fight. Suddenly, he notices that Rei is still carrying a gun. Without waiting for Rei's response, he takes her gun. After a brief explanation from Koda about how to use the gun, he begins to fire off rounds. Just then, a more dangerous situation arises. The vehicle, which had stalled from the previous collision, fails to restart. This time, Saya is not ready to stand by idly. She gets out of the car, picks up the shotgun, and starts firing after Psycho saves her once again. However, after some time fighting, everyone runs out of bullets. The horde of zombies still swarms them like a flood of ants. A feeling of despair and helplessness shrouds everyone. At this moment, Takashi snatches the gun from Saya's hands and charges towards the zombie horde, making noise all the while. Seiko realizes that he is trying to lure the zombies away. After kicking a zombie away, she also pulls out her wooden sword and runs towards the horde to help Takashi. As expected, some of the zombies are drawn away by the two of them, but there is still a large group of zombies rushing towards the remaining people. Just as Rei and Seiya are embracing each other, waiting for death, a familiar voice rings out from behind them. It's a team of people in firefighter protective suits. They set up high-pressure water cannons to clear the zombies. After the ordeal, when these rescuers remove their helmets, everyone realizes that their commander is none other than Saya's mother. Although they were successfully rescued, there is no joy of survival, because now Takashi and Seiko, who lured the zombies away, have been separated from the main group by the zombies. From now on, they can only rely on themselves to find a way to survive. Two high school students, Takashi and Saeko, were left to wonder what they could do to survive in a city swarming with zombies. Just an hour ago, the two, who were ready to risk their lives and draw the zombies away, had become separated from the main group. The two had no choice but to take a detour and head to Saya's house from another direction. Relying on memory, Takashi led Saeko to a motorcycle shop they had seen before. They initially planned to grab a bike and go, but unexpectedly found a four-wheeled amphibious motorcycle in the warehouse. They rode it recklessly, with Takashi planning to use the bike's ability to travel over water to reach an island in the middle of a lake. There, they could safely spend the night. No sooner had Takashi finished speaking than he twisted the throttle hard, and the bike hurtled into the river, sending up a huge splash. A self-satisfied Takashi quickly checked on Seiko, only to witness a smelly scene. Feeling Takashi's intense gaze, Seiko quickly covered herself. Afterwards, they rode to the small island in the middle of the river. Takashi found dry clothes from his backpack for Seiko. Once she had changed, he turned around to see that the wet play had turned into a play in a chongsam, which made him flustered. After some awkward talk, they noticed that the number of zombies on the shore had significantly decreased, so they hit the road again. This time, Takashi drove the motorcycle directly into a city fountain. Before a soaked Seiko could protest, he found some tape to fix the throttle, causing the bike to keep moving. Seiko then understood. Takashi wanted to create a noise source to attract the zombies, creating a path for them to escape. Without saying a word, she dashed out swinging her wooden sword, leaving Takashi in awe. But in the next second, she stood frozen in place. There were two child zombies. While Seiko was distracted, the zombie children lunged at her with gaping mouths. In the nick of time, Takashi pushed Seiko aside and shoved the barrel of his gun into one zombie's mouth. 
Without a moment to speak, Takashi grabbed Seiko's hand and they started running for their lives. After a long run, they finally found a shrine to rest. There, Takashi found an authentic ceremonial knife. But since the earlier incident, Saeko seemed distracted. Takashi handed her a dry school uniform to change into and then gave her a package of something good he'd just found. Seeing it, Seiko finally let out a laugh, but the atmosphere quickly turned awkward again. Curious, Takashi asked why she had frozen earlier. Seiko told him that she was reminded of what terror felt like. She explained that she also had a boy she liked, but she never dared to express her feelings because she didn't think she was good enough for him. Takashi found this unbelievable as he thought any boy would be attracted to a girl like Saeko. She then asked him what they would think if they knew she almost killed someone. Hearing this, Takashi was stunned. It turns out that four years ago, one night, Saeko was walking home alone when a man suddenly sprang out to attack her. But because she was carrying a wooden sword, she didn't lose. In fact, she managed to break the man's shoulder blade and femur. The police didn't say much when they found out and even took her home. Takashi comforted her, saying it was simply a matter of excessive self-defense. But what Seiko said next completely shocked him. She explained that she was actually happy. The feeling of finding a clear enemy had excited her so much that she had even trembled. She knew she had the upper hand with the wooden sword, so she had intentionally acted scared to lure the man into her trap, then counterattacked without hesitation. The feeling was so exhilarating it drove her to a peak of madness. But this was also the true nature of Saeko, a girl who reveled in power and found joy in it, yet still held a sincere girl's heart. Takashi was stunned, wondering if such a thing would be allowed. Seiko continued to explain on her own, recalling the moment at the fountain where she realized she hadn't changed, but had actually become more severe. Before she could finish, Takashi grabbed her hand and kissed her in surprise, but without using his tongue. The next morning, Takashi cautiously opened the shrine's main gate. He was planning to sneak out from the back of the shrine with Seiko. If they took this route, they would only need to walk for about 20 minutes to reach Saya's house. But while he was talking, zombies started to slowly crawl up from under the stairs. As more and more zombies appeared, Takashi wanted to tell Saeko to run, but she seemed hesitant and didn't move. Takashi, looking seriously at Seiko, didn't say much. He moved behind her and suddenly grabbed her sexy body. If she needed a reason, then he would give her one. No matter how tainted Seiko might be, as long as he was alive, he would continue to like her and believe in her. So she was not allowed to die, even if it was for him. She had to live on, accepting all her sins and being her true self. Finally, Seiko came to her senses. She accepted herself as she was, and this operation also instantly revitalized her. She placed her hand on the hilt of her sword let out a shout and burst forward. She was like a tiger killing two pigs, a tornado destroying a parking lot. Gradually, her eyes started to light up with excitement, and this was the feeling she couldn't resist. After the two of them managed to escape, they ran along the road. Seiko grabbed Takashi's hand and asked him seriously if he would take responsibility for what he said. Takashi was taken aback, but then confidently declared that he absolutely hoped to do so. After a hard-fought battle, Takashi and Seiko supported each other and finally found Saya's home. Little Alice was so excited to see the pair return safely, she leapt into their arms. At Saya's house, they all began to live seemingly ordinary days. In this place, Seiko also dressed in an elegant kimono, causing Takashi to blushingly express how well it suited her. However, Seiko seemed to misunderstand Takashi's comment. Just as Takashi was about to explain, she stopped him, resulting in an awkward silence. Eventually, they both burst into laughter at the situation. Just then, Alice popped up again. But as Takashi was teasing Alice, a heated argument could be heard. It seemed that Seiya was having a dispute with her mother. As Takashi was about to ask about it, he was abruptly interrupted by an irate Saya, who stormed off without looking back. Then Saya's mother came out, apologized to Takashi, and asked if he was getting accustomed to living here. Takashi expressed that he felt very comfortable and at ease. He knew that the commander's house was luxurious, but he never expected it to be this extravagant. However, Seiya's mother revealed that they couldn't stay here for long. Maintaining such a large network of water and electricity supply required many highly organized experts working together. From the very beginning of the disaster, the commander had unilaterally dispatched troops to protect power plants and water plants, but the people there couldn't work endlessly, as they also had families. So she wanted to ask Takashi to persuade Seiya to escape together. On the other hand, Saya told Kota that she felt the adults here were not taking them seriously. 
seriously. Therefore, she planned to gather everyone to discuss a strategy. Soon, everyone gathered in Ray's room. Saya told everyone that they needed to discuss a matter that concerned whether they would continue to be companions in the future. Now, they had two choices, either be absorbed by a larger group or part ways. But Takashi didn't think there was a need to separate. After all, Saya's parents had considerable influence. Just then, a noisy sound of car engines came from outside. Saya's father, Takagi, had returned. Accompanying him was a cage containing a man, a former servant of the house, who sacrificed his life to save his companions during a mission. While his actions were noble, he was no longer human. Takagi loudly proclaimed this conclusion. He then ordered the cage to be opened. The zombie, no longer human, instantly rushed out, heading towards the craving for flesh. The samurai sword that had been held high suddenly fell. Amidst the incredulous stares of everyone present, the zombie's head flew high into the air, eventually falling back down. Takagi explained to everyone present this was the reality of their current world. On the balcony, Takashi and the others were shaken by the scene unfolding before them. However, Kota was mumbling to himself with his head lowered. He thought that the efficiency of the sword was too low. Once it hit bone, it would become useless after three or four uses. As he spoke, Kota became agitated. Takashi was about to step in and calm him down, but in the next moment, Kota pushed Takashi aside and roared that he was someone who couldn't even handle a gun properly. After saying this, he stormed off, leaving everyone stunned. However, little Alice bravely stepped forward, offering to be a messenger between Takashi and Kota. But after Kota stormed off, no matter how they searched, they couldn't find him. Suddenly, Alice ran up to Takashi and informed him that Kota was in big trouble. A group of adults had surrounded Kota, demanding that he surrender his weapons. They argued, in this dangerous world, it wasn't fair for one person to hoard so many weapons. Despite Kota desperately explaining that the weapons were borrowed, the adults were relentless and even prepared to seize them. In the end, Saya's father, Takagi, came to intervene. He asked Kota why he was so unwilling to give up his weapons. Just as Kota was about to struggle with his response, Takashi stepped forward from the crowd. He stated that he was doing this to protect Saya. From the very beginning of the disaster, it had been Kota who protected Saya. Saeko also expressed her great respect for Kota's courage. Finally, Saya herself stood up to her father, saying it was Kota who had kept her safe. She declared that without him, she would have long since become one of the zombies. After saying this, Saya fearlessly met the gaze of her parents, standing defiantly against them. In such a chaotic world, it's even reported that the Prime Minister of Japan has been violently attacked and his plane has crashed. So it's better not to trust one's own observations or blindly trust the official narrative from the government. Saya doesn't believe the reports on TV. She thinks that the so-called murderous disease is nothing but nonsense, an excuse used by the government because they can't find the cause of corpses attacking humans. She believes it's a simple measure to soothe the public's fear and anxiety. However, the adults refuse to believe what's happening. They think it must be a new type of infectious disease. How could there possibly be corpses coming back to life? Such a bizarre thing. But Saya explains to them that there's only one solution to this situation. It would require countless top medical experts to research and experiment day and night in a safe environment to find a solution. But right now, there are no conditions or talents to accomplish this. After hearing that, the adults are stunned. But those who refuse to believe soon find a new excuse. A woman claims that this is a plot by violent high school students to justify their misuse of firearms and violence with alarmist rhetoric. But peace-loving adults will never allow such a thing to happen. As soon as these words come out, they immediately gain a lot of support. Unfortunately, arguing with such narrow-minded people is a pure waste of breath. Humans are creatures who strive to escape reality and refuse to face it. Because if they don't acknowledge the facts, they don't have to acknowledge their own stupidity and mistakes. On the other side, Saya's father, Takagi, finds Seiko. It turns out that he was also one of the apprentices under Seiko's father. He presents a famous sword, which is said to be able to cut through a pig's bone in one stroke. But without a proper reason, Seiko refuses to accept it. Takagi laughs, saying that her character is indeed like her father's. He then admits that the reason for giving the sword is to hope that Seiko can protect Seiya. But Seiko is confused. If he is worried about his daughter, he should keep her by his side. Moreover, if he has to entrust her to someone, it should be Takashi, who is the leader of the team. Takagi explains that although he trusts Takashi as an outstanding man, it's clear that he is still very lost. But at this time, Takashi is really puzzled. He thinks that in terms of combat, Seiko, Kota, Rei, Saya are smart enough. Shizuka is a doctor, and even little Alice is always ready. 
Rei bursts into laughter. She tells Takashi that everyone likes him because of the responsibility and courage he shows. Even if he is scared, he will bravely step forward at crucial moments. There is no reason, just because he knows he must do so. Rei explains that's why she must be with him, willing to do anything for him, even if he already likes someone else. After hearing this, Takashi throws her heavy body onto the bed, his feelings complex. Such a reason is too realistic, and he doesn't know whether he should be happy. Takashi gets off the bed and sits aside. Rei is ready to leave, but not before she tells Takashi to think carefully about what she just said. As Rei leaves, she opens the door to find Seiko, who seems to have been waiting there for a while. Without any further pleasantries, Rei asks Seiko to also talk to Takashi. Afterwards, Takashi sought out Saya's father to bid him farewell. He needed to travel to a nearby elementary school to rescue his own mother. And Rei's father was the police chief of that area, so no matter what, he had a compelling reason to go there. If his family needed him, he would choose to stay. Takagi didn't say much. Takashi and Rei had also packed their things. Just when the two were ready to set off, Saeko had also dressed in combat gear, indicating she wanted to join them. Takashi was quite pleased with her hormone-radiant outfit, but Rei was notably dissatisfied. Suddenly, Rei seemed to notice something and rushed out with her spear. It turned out that teacher Shady had also arrived at Seiya's estate. Rei pointed her spear at Shady's shady face, scaring him to wet his pants. It turned out that Shady's father was a member of the parliament. Because Rei's father had once strongly opposed his parliamentary proposal, he had arranged for Shady to hold Rei back a grade in school. As she grew more agitated, Rei's spear point scratched Shady's cheek. At this moment, Takagi came out of the house. He told Rei that although he had some acquaintance with Shady's father in the past, it didn't matter now. If she wanted, she could kill Shady outright. Hearing this, Takashi wanted to stop her, but was held back by Seiko, but Shady stated that he was ready to die. After all, if he were killed, Rei would be tormented by this incident forever. This would be his greatest lesson as a teacher to his students. After a standoff, Rei chose to lower her gun because such a scumbag was not worth killing. This outcome made Shady feel utterly humiliated, but Takagi didn't give him any further opportunity to explain and threw him and his group of corrupted students out of the estate, leaving them to survive on their own. Little did they know, the United States, Japan, and Russia had simultaneously used nuclear strikes at the same time. This action made the staff at the space station sigh, commenting that such a plot would not even be adopted in Hollywood. Four missiles rose from the Earth. Their dazzling light seemed like a cluster of poppies in the apocalypse, bright and lethal. From this moment, the world would truly plunge into darkness. On the other side, within the estate of Seiya's family, Shizuka seemed to have remembered something and became cheerful. It turns out she finally remembered her friend Kaiori's phone number, so she hurriedly dialed it. However, they had barely spoken a few words when the phone signal cut off. Then, a fierce white light burst from the sky, bright and dazzling. Following that, all the televisions, computers, and mobile phones were destroyed and went dark. Even pacemakers completely stopped working. Seiya analyzed that they had suffered a nuclear shock, commonly known as an electromagnetic pulse, which causes all electronic devices to malfunction. According to the current situation, it appeared that a nuclear warhead had exploded in the atmosphere. The energy released caused a wide area electromagnetic pulse. Due to the recent electromagnetic pulse, most of the Saya family's protective facilities had failed, and within this short period, a horde of zombies had broken through the defenses and reached their doorstep. Takagi ordered the manual closure of the large gate and to defend it at all costs. Still, a zombie managed to get in, but the next second, a gunshot rang out and the zombie fell. It was Koda. Saya's mother was then armed by a servant. She discarded her shawl, ripped her skirt, and armed herself. It turned out that Saya's mother was a former agent. Her shooting skills were even better than those of her husband, Takagi. She handed a pistol to Saya for self-defense and asked Koda to teach her daughter how to use it. Koda was delighted and promised to teach her. As more and more zombies came, the gate they were defending could no longer hold and was broken open by the zombie army. Chaos ensued inside the mansion with screams for help, pushes, and trampling. Many residents in the residential area were caught off guard and bitten. Takashi and the others did their best to help the defenders counterattack. Saeko swung her blade, beautifully harvesting the lives of zombies. Kota set up a rifle, and each shot was a headshot. Even little Alice wasn't idle, squatting aside and handing him ammunition. But the zombies seemed endless, and everyone eventually ran out of strength and ammunition. Reluctantly, Takagi ordered the formation of a team to break through the enemy lines. Any man with a will to fight could join. 
Women, children, and the elderly were left behind to hold the line. He entrusted his daughter to Takashi and Kota, reminding them to stand firm in their beliefs as men. Saya was about to object, but her mother pulled her aside, slapped her, and seriously told her that she and her father had an inescapable responsibility, and they regretted entrusting her to Takashi and Kota. Saya understood the good intentions of her parents all along, but now was not the time for familial affection. Saya shouted she loved her dad and mom, unsure if this was their last goodbye. With his beloved daughter finally leaving with her companions, Takagi no longer hesitated and immediately ordered a full counterattack. Intense gunfire erupted in this once beautiful mansion. Takagi also joined the battle, looking at his beautiful wife fighting beside him. He smiled. His wife was indeed the most outstanding woman in the world. Without much talk, the two began to slaughter the zombies in perfect synergy. On this side, Takashi and his group successfully reached the garage. The Tesla they had previously driven was equipped with an anti-pulse device, so it could still start and drive normally. This time, even Seiya, who had never fired a gun before, turned into a Bloody Mary. She decisively shot a zombie in the head, not minding the stench of fresh blood splattering on her face. With the help of a mechanic, the group got into the vehicle and prepared to leave. However, the mechanic expressed his desire to stay behind because the woman he loved was still there with everyone else. There was no need for excessive tears and sadness at parting. After exchanging smiles, Shizuka stepped on the gas, ramming through the zombies and speeding away. The vehicle raced through the estate and finally burst out of the main gate. Inside the mansion, Saya's mother told Takagi that their daughter had escaped with a group of lovely young people. Takagi chuckled lightly. With this, there were no more concerns holding them back. After the escape, no one overly comforted Saya. After all, in such situations, the comfort of others often doesn't help. But at this moment, Takashi expressed his hope that everyone would accompany him first to find his and Rei's family members. After that, they would together rescue Shizuka's friend. The new journey began again, and everyone was filled with fighting spirit. The vehicle then hit the freeway. Under the illumination of the sunset, the road ahead was filled with rotting zombies. However, no one showed a disgusted or anxious expression. After all, a new journey is meant to be a challenge. As long as they work together, they can overcome all difficulties and obstacles. This is Daniel CC Movie Channel. Stay safe and enjoy your day.